Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Because the issue of abortion and the issue of free speech rights and, and the infringement on free speech rights and the freedom to speak for Christians and conservatives, these are absolutely the two issues that I'm, I'm most excited about and also enjoy talking about them because what I find is, as I, as I kind of go from town to town and from state to state, I find out that the mainstream media is not covering this stuff uh, and that there is a lot to be learned and uh, that there is a lot to be done. So what I'm going to do in this first hour is to talk about sort of the crisis of free speech on campuses and how that affects conservative Christians. And the way that I approach this is I generally go through and I tell stories that illustrate the problems. And I talk about cases that I've been involved in. Um, and I complain a lot about things out there uh, that are bad, but I do not complain unless I have a solution. And I promise you, I won't get up without sharing good news with you guys. But I want to begin then by talking about the issue of um, sort of the, the assault on constitutional freedoms on our college campuses. And really how I got involved in the fight and how we've been able to have some success. Uh, in the year 1993, I was indeed hired as an atheist and a political leftist by the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. People often ask, how did someone as conservative as you become a professor at a public school? It's really simple. I, I sneaked in there as an atheist and then I converted. I mean, <laughs> it was all the right proposition, but uh, it wasn't Rocky and Welch or anything like that. But uh, that's just kind of the way that things have worked out. But I was indeed hired on August 1st of 1993 as a college professor at UNC Wilmington. But what's interesting is that I knew that there was a problem on our college campuses about a year before that. Uh, when I was a, a graduate student and when I was on the left politically and an atheist, the one good thing that I had going for me back then, other than that I could play guitar and that somehow, you know, uh, finance my education, the one good thing back then was that I was in the habit of reading people that I disagreed with. Uh, I've kept up with that habit, by the way. I, I, I believe that it's very important for us not to stay in our Christian bubbles. We're supposed to go out there and figure out what the enemy is doing. We need to be educated. We need to understand what the opposition is up to. And I was already in that habit back in 1992 as a leftist. I read an interesting book by Dinesh D'Souza, and it was a book called Real Work Liberal Education. And boy, did that fire me up. I mean, I read that book, and I realized that there was actually something wrong with political correctness on our college campuses. And uh, I didn't know it yet, but I would read a, a case that was in illiberal education, which would actually be my first uh, effort, my, I guess my first experience to learn about a thing called the Campus Speech Code, which is a very dangerous weapon that is used against Christians these days. But I was reading in D'Souza's book, and he talked about what is now the infamous Water Buffalo episode at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'll share the story with you. This is my intro, my way of sort of illustrating what a speech code is, and then I'll work to sort of how that's used against Christians. Uh, but there was this incident that occurred at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with a Jewish student, and he was a, a very studious uh, student, and he was in his dorm room, uh, up on the second floor of the dorm room that overlooked the quad at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's trying his best to study, when all of a sudden he hears this very loud 
giggling and squealing and laughing out there in the quad. And what do you think it was? Of course, it was a campus sorority. And so he got up and he walked over to the window and he was about to shut the window so that he could go back and sit down at his desk and study. But before he shut the window, he shouted, hey, why don't you shut up, you bunch of white buffaloes? Uh -huh. Now, that's because I know some of you are kind of looking at me like, who says that, you know? I mean, I know I say that every day when I run into a loud and obnoxious person, you know, down at the DMV or something. I'm like, well, shut up, you bunch of white buffaloes. I'm kidding. I've never used that phrase in my life. But he used it, and he didn't really think a whole lot about it until the next day, when all of a sudden, he gets a knock on his dorm room door. And it's someone from the Dean's Students Office, and they're actually presenting him with a citation, a charge uh, uh, for engaging racial harassment. Now, they hand this paper to him and tell him that he's going to have a hearing uh, with the Dean's Students Office in a couple of weeks, and he needs to prepare for it. And he, he just asked them, he said, I, I don't understand how, that was, how shouting water buffalo was racial harassment. And, and they, they responded by saying, well, it was a black sorority. You, you, you couldn't see, you didn't look out the window, you just heard, it was a black sorority. And he, he said, yeah, but I still don't understand how that's racial harassment. And he tried to explain that he was Jewish and there was a Yiddish word that translated into water buffalo, it's like a hamath or something like that. And he, he, he translated into water buffalo and it meant loud and obnoxious person. And it had absolutely nothing to do with race. And they said, well, we don't care. Isn't that interesting? They were sort of imposing their own cultural definitions on him. I thought the universities were into diversity and all of that. I don't know. Uh, but it certainly was contradictory. And uh, believe it or not, the University of Pennsylvania moved forward with this hearing against the young kid. What happened was that the student newspaper heard about it. And they decided to write an article asking, you know, that the really central crucial question here, which is what does the term water buffalo have to do with race relations? We've never heard that. We've heard some others, but we've not heard that one. And so uh, someone decided to write a, uh, an article in the student newspaper. And what was really great about it was that there was a very principled professor by the name of Alan Charles Forbes. Uh, who was a very distinguished professor, uh, who is a libertarian leaning conservative, and he's also of Jewish descent. And when he heard about it, he said, oh, I know the word that they're talking about. That, that, is, that has absolutely nothing to do with race. And so he decided, he was so angry about the stupidity of the whole incident, that he decided to actually run an article in the Philadelphia newspaper. And so then it was read by millions of people. And this created an unbelievable embarrassment for the University of Pennsylvania because in no way can they explain how the term water buffalo had a racial connotation to it. And so what they did then was to actually drop the charges against the kid. And uh, it was really clear because Alan Charles Ors will come back into our story in just a few minutes because he never forgot about the incident and he decided that he was going to start to champion students' rights with regard to free speech and due process. And we will circle around back to him in just a few minutes. But, you know, listen, I just read the book and I became aware of these very strange harassment codes that they had on college campuses back in 1992 as I was finishing my dissertation. So I finished up and I took the job in 93 and having read this in form of the book, the very first thing that I did when I became a professor was to actually sit down and take a look at our student and faculty handbook to see if we had one of these crazy, crazy speech codes and or harassment codes. And so I sat down and read it and I found that my university, the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, actually had one of these codes that said, you cannot engage in speech that is offensive or makes anyone feel uncomfortable along the lines of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, politics, so on and so forth. And I read the thing, and it was just immediately obvious to me that it was unconstitutional. The idea of a ban on offensive speech you know, the first thing that I thought about was uh, a, a quotation by Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes when he was writing a dissenting opinion in Gitmo versus uh, New York, a 1925 Supreme Court decision. He had an excellent line that really summed it up. It said, every idea is an incitement. 
What was Justice Holmes saying when he said that? He was saying that just about any idea, if it has any merit whatsoever, is going to be potentially offensive to someone. Right. And I think that's true because I think we look around in our society today and we see people that are just deeply offended by the concept of same-sex marriage. I think it is a moral monstrosity. I believe that it was just created to, first of all, shut churches down. I've got a whole theory on that and enforcing churches to perform same-sex wedding. Uh, I, I just think the whole thing was intended to be an insult towards God. But I see people who are on the other side of the debate who think that opposition to same-sex marriage is offensive. They, they don't really believe that. And so I really think that Justice Holmes was on to something when he said that every idea is an incitement. And so I took that speech code into my department chair at Stephen McNamee's office, and I showed it to him, and I said, this thing is unconstitutional. And he said, why? I said, you can't. You can't ban all kinds of speech. In order to do that, you would have to ban all speech. <laughs> it's just antithetical to what we stand for as Americans in this country. And he at, I really appreciate what he said. He's an honest liberal. Some of you might think that's an oxymoron. He's an honest liberal. He really is. And he was truthful about it. He said, but Mike, you don't understand. They're only talking about certain types of speech. And I was like, thank you for your honesty. But I did not have to worry about that kind of speech code at all back in 1993. Why? Because I held all the right views. And on a college campus, that means I held all the left views. And so it was no big deal for me. And I would later on in 1996, I would convert to theism. In the year 2000, I would specifically convert to Christianity. Uh, somewhere in between there, 1999, I joined the Republican Party and the NRA, but that has nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I need to shoot off on that. No pun intended there. But something really interesting happened uh, with our friend Alan Charles Forbes right around that time. In the year 1998, he wrote a book called Shadow University, and he co-wrote it with a guy I also know who was a college professor at Harvard, Harvard Law School, and a very prominent defense attorney in this country by the name of Harvey Silverblade. Now, he's a liberal leaning libertarian, and the two of them got together and they wrote a book called Shadow University, in which they talked about the outrageousness of campus speech codes, and not only that, but how when they prosecute things on college campuses, generally they just have tangible reports. They don't have any due process whatsoever. Um, uh, students will go in and they'll be 18, 19 years old and they'll have to face a university attorney. And they're facing getting thrown out of their college or their university with no due process whatsoever. So Alan decided to write the book. And as a result of writing the book, he just begins to get this absolute explosion of complaints from all across the United States of America. And he realized that the problem for free speech and due process on our college campuses was so severe that they were going to have to create an organization that they would later call the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which is located in Philadelphia. Now, I want all of you to make a note of their web address because we're actually going to use it in a minute. I'm a college professor. I will give you homework. <laughs> that is what we do, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, I'll get back to that in just a second. But www.thefire.org. It's real simple. T-H-E-F-I-R-E dot O-R-G. That's just www.thefire.org. That's the organization that he started back in the year 2000. And he just to deal with the problems of due process and free speech on our campuses. And I'll tell you something, when, that, when, when it was established, I had no idea in the year 2000 that I was going to be one of their first plaintiffs in just one year. I had no idea. There actually was a point in my life when I did not go around looking for trouble. These days, I've become quite a community disorganized, I guess. <laughs> Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, is that a real job? Actually, yeah, I'm here tonight. <laughs> but, no, seriously. Um, in, in 2001, uh, I, I know that we all were deeply affected by 911. A lot of people obviously lost friends and loved ones in 911. But I think for just about everyone and the adult in the United States of America it really changed their perspective. It really changed their worldview. And I understand it affected everyone's life a lot. It affects
fact that my is a little bit more than the average person. In fact, it's the reason I'm standing here this evening. Uh, without this incident occurring, I would not, I would not be here doing this. Uh, but I actually received only four days after 911. I actually received this pretty long email from a former student uh, of mine by the name of Rosa Florida. Um, and she was a student I had the year before. She's a communist, and I'm not using that in a derisive sense. I'm using it in a descriptive sense. This is a woman who took my class in the fall of 2000, and she would come to class every day wearing a beret and combat boots. I mean, this young woman was ready for a revolution. I don't understand the campus communists, though. They want a revolution, but they don't have guns. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> she was just dressed and ready to go. Well, four days after 911, she sent a a missive of about 500 words that was called In Dedication to an Undivided Humanity, in which she said that the attacks of 911 were the fault of America, that we deserved it because of our foreign policy. And I can tell you when I read that thing, I was just so angry because uh, I had a couple of friends in New York City, and if you remember that time, it took about six weeks to get through to New York City because you just weren't going to get through. From cell phone, whatever you had, you just weren't getting through. And um, a few days after 911, some of you probably remember that Rudy Giuliani asked the federal government for 30,000 body bags. And so people in this country, we were later about 3,000 died, but for a while people thought it was 30,000. And so the, what we learned later is he suspected that many of the bodies were blown to bits. And so there were going to be a lot more than the actual number of deaths. And so th this was the backdrop. And she sent this thing out, I think something like 18 different people. And she said at the end, you know, please forward it to anyone who's interested in reply or, or forward it to anyone who's interested in joining this discussion. Well, I certainly feel to about six friends of mine who were in the United States Marines. <laughs> I mean, I sent it to some of my buddies up at Camp Lejeune and said, man, look at this anti-American garbage that's going on at UNC Wilmington. But I did respond, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, my first response is not something I can repeat. I, I, I wrote things I should not have written, but I did the right thing. I did not hit the sin button. I'm like, well, that's wrong. Delete that. Don't send an email when you're angry. Okay? Don't ever do that. So I didn't, I, I should have written in the first place, but I deleted it. Called the woman, and I waited about four days. And my response was pretty simple. I said, you know, the Constitution protects your speech just as it has protected bigoted, unintelligent, and immature speech for many years. Exercise those freedoms. You open yourself up to criticism from other people who don't share your views, who have the same rights. And some Christians have criticized me for sending that email. And they said it was harsh. I will defend that email to my dying day. It was immature speech. I didn't say she was immature. I said it was bigoted, unintelligent, and immature. Yes, it was a childish thing to write right after 911. Yes, it's bigoted to say that people deserve to die. Uh, you know, I stand behind the content of that. And I wrote it and I said, that's as tough a man as you're getting from me, given the circumstances. Well, I, I thought that that was it. You know, I just sent the email. Um, about a week after that, I actually got a phone call uh, from my provost, John Cavanaugh, and he called me at home and he says, well, you know, I've got bad news for you. Uh, this uh, student's angry at you and so is her mother. Her mother was a college administrator uh, and also a communist. And, you know, I, I might have made some jokes in there, the email exchanges, and, you know, her mommy is a communist, so on and so forth, and, you know, kind of joke around that. But, but, uh, as I was going back and forth with my Marine friends, but uh, what happened basically was that uh, um, they had said that I had violated our email use policy. What I didn't realize is that sometime between 1993 and 2001, they had written some other speech codes in addition to the main one. And they actually had a specific speech code for uh, email use. It said you may not engage in speech that is abusive or berates people. It just went on and on with these adjectives that, once again, could describe any type of speech whatsoever. And I said, well, what does this mean? And they said, well, what it means is that we're going to have to go through and read every email that you sent during the one-week period, and the opposing party has asked that we turn over a wall of the private email addresses 
of every single person that you communicated with, whether on campus or off campus. And I responded, and I said, you're, you're crazy. You can't do that. And, you know, I, I said, here, here's the deal, John. Let me explain things to you. This is my provost I'm talking to, my boss. I said, the United States Constitution says I can express my opinions. This is a public university, so the Constitution applies in public university. Since 1925 in the Gitlow case that I just quoted to you. That's been the rule of law. But over here, you have a university policy in the handbook that says you can't say those things. So I said to my boss, John, let me explain things slowly. When you have a conflict of laws between the United States Constitution and the UNCW faculty and student handbook, the handbook doesn't win. The Constitution wins because the Constitution is the law of the land, not the university handbook. Yep. And I joke around about it, but this is every single case I've dealt with over the last 12 years of being an activist in this area has been a situation where the university tried to pay for the Constitution with its own policies because they believe that they are separate entities that are accountable to no one at all. And this is every single case, and that's the reason why I share it with you. Many people give the story and say, well, you're using the university uh, computer when you responded. You're using the university email address. And I ask them if they have ever been to a university and used the toilet. Yeah. Because guess what? The university owns the bathroom installs as well. That doesn't mean they can go peeking inside of them. You do retain some right to privacy on public property. This is all incredibly simple. And I explained it to my brothers, to be honest with you, he's a little scared. You know, he's like, well, okay, I'm sorry, I'll make this go away. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't go away because I'm still talking about it. You'd be like, that's a bad story if that's the end of it. A uh, university attorney actually called me about a week after that and said, hey, I'm really sorry, but we're actually going to have to go in there and read these messages and turn over a log of how long you talk to people and what their names are and what their uh, email addresses are. We're just going to have to do this. And I said, well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to change your mind, uh, but if you don't, I made a promise that day. I said, I, if, if you go in there and read one message, I will declare public relations nuclear warfare on this university. I told them. I promised them. And what that mean? It meant I was going to call my friends at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education. And I picked up that phone and I called 215-717-3473. You can tell I called them a lot. <laughs> but it's 215 the fire. And I called them on the phone. And I told them about the story. And they got on the phone and they called John Leo of the U.S. News and World Report, the third largest magazine in the United States of America. And sure enough, the university went in there and read those emails and turned over all that private information uh, to the socialist student and her socialist mother. And as soon as they did it, we got on the phone and called Leo and he called the university. And then John Leo called me and he says, Mike Adams, you tell me that the university went in and they read your private email messages. I just got off the phone with the university and they said that they didn't do it. What if it was lying? And I told John Leo, I said, I'll take a polygraph. He said, you're not lying. <laughs> and I'm going to write about this in U.S. News and World Report. That's another point where I have to stop in the story and tell you that this happens every single day. The universities not only try and paper over the Constitution with their own policies, every time we catch them, or almost every time we catch them, they simply lie and say that they didn't do it. This is a very common, it doesn't surprise you, does it? Because the university's God has been kicked out of the universities for a very long time, and that's when dishonesty crept in, ladies and gentlemen. There is no moral foundation to these universities. No, they don't mind lying because they don't believe in the truth. You understand? That's an extremely important position. That's an extremely important part of their worldview. So it's pretty awesome. I told John about this, and John trusted me. And John went and he wrote a U.S. News and World Report and I went to Barnes and Noble and got a copy and read it and said, this is actually kind of fun. I think the first time I said, I might be a community disorganizer. This is kind of fun. <laughs> well, I'm not the only one who read it. Sean Hannity read it. And Sean Hannity called me in the office the next day and said, would you like to come on Hannity and Calls? And being from Texas, I just said, giddy up. I, 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 it's a great opportunity, and it was pretty fantastic because I actually went on Hannity and Collins when Alan Collins, the liberal, was on. 
And when I showed up in that studio, you know, in Raleigh to be me up to New York, uh, I couldn't see the screen. All I could hear was a plug in my ear. And all I could hear is the whining voice of Alan Cole. I thought they played a trick on me. But Alan Cole leads off the segment, and he just jumped in with, with, with both fists. And he said, I think it is an outrage. He says, I don't agree with you politically on anything, but I think it's an outrage what they did. But the Hannity and Coles jumped to my defense, you know, offered to get me an attorney wow. to fight the thing. Both of them, Coles did. And so as soon as that thing hit Hannity and Coles, Rush Limbaugh picked it up on the radio. <laughs> Neil Brooks, the Libertarian, actually picked it up um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the Boston Globe picked it up. The local Boston Globe took my side. The, the conservative, the Washington Times, took my side. Uh, who else? NPR picked it up. The thing went absolutely viral. The Chronicle of Higher Education took my side in the controversy. This thing just went absolutely viral. And what I love, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education did, was they did a press release, and they put the pictures and the email addresses and the office phone numbers right off the website of my chancellor and my provost and the university attorney. <laughs> And all of a sudden, John Kavanaugh is having his own traumatic email experience. He's getting thousands of emails from across the country. And he calls me on, uh, he actually emailed me, and he said, Mike, he says, I'm getting a lot of emails, and he says, could you help me out? And I said, no. He said, I can't. I said, welcome to Conservatism 101. You make a choice, you face the consequences. I told you not to do it. I told you it would be public relations, nuclear warfare. And the result of that was that they had to issue a statement that said, we support Dr. Mike Adams' right to speak out on any issue whatsoever. <laughs> the way he CC'd me on that, I, I teared up a little bit. <laughs> I printed that sucker out and I framed it and put it on the wall of my office at the end of the semester. The university was taught a very serious lesson about law. <clears throat> And they were taught a very serious lesson about trying to paper over the Constitution with their own policies to suppress conservative speech, because this kind of thing never happens to liberals on college campuses under any circumstances whatsoever. And so I remember going home after that break and saying, you know, what am I going to do? That was actually kind of fun. And I came back in the spring semester, and that's the, the, the point where I decided to just come out and start doing this. And I actually started writing a weekly, excuse me, a monthly column for the American Family Association's Agape Press. After about 10 monthly columns, Rush Limbaugh read one, he liked it so much, he put my face up on his website and read the thing on the air. And the result of that was I get this strange phone call from this guy in my office. He calls up and he goes, hey, professor, that's Bill Harvey. Hey, professor, this is Bill. Bill who? Bill O'Reilly. I'm like, really? Oh, really? He's like, no, we're right there. He's like, hey, right. <laughs> and I think that is actually Bill O'Reilly. Right around that time, he invites me to go on the show. You want to go on the O'Reilly Factor? I'm like, oh, my goodness, get it up. I'm from Texas. It's what we have to say here, I think. But anyway, um, I, I, I went on the O'Reilly Factor, and fortunately, as Providence would have it, uh, Jonathan Garthway, who never watches TV, happened to be watching the O'Reilly Factor that evening. He's the editor of townhall.com. And he sent me an email the next day, and he said, would you like to be one of our weekly writers? And I said, I don't think I have enough material, but I can't turn it down. It's such a larger platform than the American Family Association's copy press. I had to take it. And as soon as I started writing for them, people just started to flock to me and started to say, I've had the same experience as well. I write four columns. I got a book contract. When I wrote the book, I get invited to speak at CPAC. When I spoke at CPAC, the Young Americans Foundation's president, Patrick Coyle, saw me speaking. And he said, would you like to be a speaker for Young Americans Foundation? I started speaking on campuses across America. 80 campuses later, I'm standing in front of you. And at one of those campuses, a guy by the name of Frank Turek, a great Christian apologist, was at, in the audience. And he got on the phone and he called some administrators and said, we've got to get this guy out of some administrators. That's the reason I'm here. Because I had this decision point in my life. Am I going to sit there and just roll over like everyone else does when they try and pay over the Constitution with their policies? Or am I going to fight? When I made that promise to the university to fight back, and I backed it up using the foundation of individual rights and education, it changed my life. And I want you guys to understand that they are a resource out there and that we can use them. 
And it, it really teaches us that something that Justice Louis Brandeis said 100 years ago was really true. Now, Brandeis might have been a political leftist, but he once said that sunlight is often the most powerful of disinfectants. And sometimes we can simply learn by stepping out there and fighting the current public opinion. Just by exposing things, violations of the First Amendment, using the First Amendment while we still got it. And I'll tell you something, you, we've got a friend in the fire. There are Christians, there are atheists, there are Buddhists, there's even a Muslim last time I checked, actually working at the fire. There are Democrats, there are Republicans, there are Calvinists, there are people who are predestined to be non-Calvinists. <laughs> Working at the fire. And they're a fantastic resource because if you're sitting there and you're worrying right now, you know, here you hear this crazy stuff going on on college campuses, and you don't know if you should send your kid to college or where you should send your kid to college. If you go to the fire.org, they have created a database of hundreds and hundreds of universities, and they have a system. It's a green light, yellow light, red light system where they go and read all the policies for you and they issue a report on what the rating is and why. I think that's extremely important yeah. because for most college kids, they'll get down to this point, and parents as well, where they're really divided between two schools. And so you might be making a decision that's going to affect your kid for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and boy, it's down to the University of Virginia and Bucknell University. And you know those are two fantastic schools. And it's like, oh, you know what? Virginia's a little bit cheaper, but you know, up now we've got a scholarship. It's the same cost. How are we going to break the tie? Here's how you break the tie. You go to the FIRE website and find what's the climate? Is it a real university with a real free and open marketplace of ideas where everyone has a right to be offended instead of a right to be comfortable? So you can go and you can check that out. And what you'll find is they publish a top 10 list Every single year, the University of Virginia is in the top 10. And my, I'm proud to say that my alma mater, Mississippi State University, is in the top 10. It's about two years ago, they went through and they abolished every speech code in the entire state. You can go and you can search the, the, the engine at Mississippi State University, and you will not see the V monologues. I think you know what the V monologues are. I'm not going to say it in front of children. It's an obscene feminist play, we'll talk about it again in just a minute, but you, you, it's never been performed on my campus. But they show the, the passion for the Christ at Humphrey Coliseum. You all need to look at the fire, and you need to go to the actual search engine of the university and just go in. You've heard crazy stuff, why not type it in? Is there an LGBT office? Well, type in LGBT office. Is there a multicultural center? Type that in. And if they have these things, you don't want to go there because the official religion of the school is postmodernism. Yep. It's relativism or some variant of that. And so you need to do the research. And you'll find as well on the FIRE website, they've got a bottom 10 as well. And Bucknell University is in the bottom 10 worst universities in the United States of America year in, year out. So you can make the decisions with that resource. But I like what the FIRE does. They educate people. And they also correct problems out there in the court of public opinion. Understanding that Brandeis was correct when he said that sunlight is often the most powerful of disinfectants. See, why is he correct? He's correct because he uses the word often. And he doesn't use the word always. We as Christians have to recognize that sometimes fighting in the court of public opinion is not enough. There are times when we must fight in the court of law as well. And I thank God Almighty that in the year 2006, I formed a close friendship with someone I've known for a couple of years, a guy by the name of David French, who has taught me a lot about litigation. We just finished a seven-year battle against my university, we won a jury verdict, and the university, uh, by the way, in two days, will be writing us a check for $665,000. I'm not even getting up. <laughs> And I had no idea in January of 2006 I was going to be his plaintiff. I just got a phone call from him in January. And he says, Mike, he said, this is David French, and I have some news for you. He had been the president of the fire. You remember how I told you that Alan Moore was founded and he was the first president. 
David took over as the second president between 2004 and 2006 for about 18 months. He's doing a great job. And he calls me on the phone in January of 2006 and he says, I'm leaving and I'm joining this group called the ADF. Then it's called the Alliance Defense Fund. Now it's called the Alliance Defending Freedom. He says, I'm leaving the And I said, why are you leaving the fire to join the ADF? He said, well, for two reasons. He said, number one, I'm going to join uh, the Army and, and join the JAG, and I'm going to oversee um, al-Qaeda interrogations in Iraq later on. The ADF has some flexibility. They're going to let me join the service. But the other reason is, I want to go gay. And I want to get back in the courtroom. I had no idea I'd be his next jury trial. I had no idea what was going to happen, providentially. But I said, well, why are you calling me and telling me this? He says, well, you're speaking for the GAF. You're traveling all across the country. What I need you to do is go to find the absolute worst policies in America and the best plaintiffs and bring them to me. And we're going to start knocking down these policies one lawsuit at a time. And so I talked to him. I already had some prospects. By the way, I brought him three lawsuits in one semester, not including me, uh, involving students. But the very first one was fascinating. Uh, it began with a phone call on the 15th of February. And there was a very distraught student at Columbia uh, by the name of Ruth Malhotra. I'd spoken to Georgia Tech, and they'd given us a hard time there, something to do with their speech code. And I, I knew we were going to cross paths with them again. But Ruth called me and said, there's been this terrible incident. I said, well, tell me what happened. Well, she told me a story of how she heard of this very obscene feminist play. We will abbreviate it and call it the V monologues. Most of you know what it is. It's supposed to be a feminist play that's a bunch of monologues that empower women. It's just ridiculous buffoonery. I mean, there is all of this obscenity, and unfortunately, the feminists are trying to turn all of your daughters into frat boys on college campuses and get them to drink and to be sexually active and to use profanity, and, and it's really a sad situation. I, I, I fear for... For, for people who are trying to raise daughters in this culture. People are just going after them these days, and the campus feminists are just the worst about it. And so they heard about this play, but at the same time they, excuse me, Ruth had a friend by the name of Arif Swar. Ruth, um, and this is going to be relevant, Ruth is half Filipino and half Asian Indian uh, and Southern Baptist. Her friend Arif is ortho an Orthodox Jewish conservative. And they heard about the play, and they thought, well, you know, it's ridiculous, but in, in a sense, it's hypocritical for us to criticize it having never seen it. So why don't we go to a performance of it on Valentine's Day? They turn V-Day, and you see what they're doing. It, it, it's really, it's terrible. They do it on that day on every campus just about in America, except Mississippi State. Let okay, me remind you, uh, and a few others, uh, Hillsdale and some other decent colleges out there. Uh, but they decided to actually attend it. And they were just blown away by the level of profanity. And they just couldn't believe uh, one of these skits that they did was called Reclaiming the C Word. And it was just awful. It reminds me of how many of you have heard of the comedian Lenny Bruce uh, before, who back in the 1950s, they were actually stealing an idea from Lenny Bruce. Lenny was Jewish and politically liberal. And uh, he used to do these routines in Manhattan. And he would get up and he would actually repeat insulting racial terms in front of people. Like he'd stand in front of someone who's black and he'd say the N-word. He'd stand in front of someone who's Jewish, like him, and say kite over and over. And he'd walk around the room and insult people. And then when he was done, he would ask the philosophical question, why do we allow words to control us the way that we do? So in a sense, the feminists could borrow from that when they wrote the V monologues. And they had this skit based upon Lenny Bruce's idea. It's called Reclaiming the Sea World. And the idea was they just get up and chant it over and over. It's just the most foul, obscene terms you can use in reference to a woman in the English language. And they thought, well, if we repeat it over and over, it will empower women. See, I don't think if you repeat obscenity over and over that it empowers you. I think you just look dumber and dumber and dumber. When you're in the third grade and you learn, you learn a curse word, you know, you might repeat it. You either grow out of that or you become a campus feminist, I suppose. <laughs> you know, Ruth and Arie just were standing there watching this thing, and they were just blown away by the level of vulgarity. And so they did something that the next day I was actually proud of them. They set up a booth in front of the union where the Women's Resource Center is located, the people who sponsored the play using student activities fees. 
and they roused well. They were up. That's what it was up. And so they set up the booth or the table. If you've ever been on the Georgia Tech campus, it's this place called the Runway. It is the most traversed area of the Georgia Tech campus, which is very, it's just, it's a big campus. And so they just put up one sign that said, we are not the C word, but they spelled it out in very big letters using magic marker. And all of a sudden, you can just imagine all these engineers are walking by with their pocket protectors and they're and all this stuff, and they're just kind of stopping. You can imagine, I mean, on a scale of one to homeschool, how awkward was that? I'm telling you. But my homeschool was, I tell you, it's like, I'm sorry, but we don't want to go a little bit better. It's like, I went to public school, and uh, I'll tell you if you drive my notes in just a second, but no, I'm just kidding. It was absolutely just attention grabbing to all these students who were walking by. And they start to legitimately ask the question, who on earth would use that kind of language in public? And Ruth and Arie said, that's exactly the question that we were trying to raise. Why don't you go in there and ask the feminists who are working in the Women's Resource Center why they do that and use your student activities? Is this ingenious or why? Because now they're ticked off. It was awkward at first, now they're ticked. They go walking into the Women's Resource Center, one after the other. They go marching in there, and at some point, the feminists in the Women's Resource Center were very angry. Imagine that. The feminists and the women are angry about something. They went marching out with magic markers, and they walked right up to the sign, and they just started mocking over the word. And so Ruth and Reed stood there and said, what do you think you're doing defacing our property? They said, you're violating the campus speech code. You can't use that word. <laughs> and they legitimately they, 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 they asked the question, well, why did you use it several hundred times last night? And they replied with a straight face. They actually said, we were using it as a term of endearment. You were using it as a term of derision. Now, what does this tell you about where we've gotten in our culture? You see, and this is a very serious point of the story, it, it, it's, it's where 1984 meets reality. Yep. And we talk about the concept of thought control. This is a very serious juncture that we've reached because what the, the argument they're actually making is that the constitutionality of a word turns upon the thought that you're having at the time you express it. If, you're, if we think, it's, it's not even turning on the thought, it's their thoughts about your thoughts. If, if we think you're thinking something ugly, we're going to prosecute you and maybe throw you out of school. But if we think you're thinking of, you know, daisies in a mountain meadow or something or something pleasant, then, oh, then fine, we'll let you go. It is insane. And the kids just didn't know what to do. So Ruth, Ruth picks up the phone and she calls me. She tells me that whole story and says, what do we do? I said, are you kidding me? What do you do? It rhymes with do. You sue. <laughs> And she's like, oh, you know, I just don't know if I can sue. See, it's the same old Christian conflict. I don't know if I can sue my own university. Gosh, I feel bad about it. So I got on the phone and I called French. And French lived in Nashville at that time, and he drove down to Atlanta. And he said, um, you know, I, I want to meet with you two. And he sat down in a coffee shop with him. I will never forget this. And he said, I, I, Mike Adams is a good friend of mine. And we talk, and it, it appears that uh, on your film, could you edit out the old school joke? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it appears, it, it appears from what I hear from Mike Adams, that while I am preparing to go off to Iraq and defend constitutional principles in a very hot place with people shooting at me, that you're not willing to defend our own constitution here in our own country in air conditioning with no one shooting at you? <laughs> What did you do when someone hits you like that? And you're like, where do we sign? <laughs> and so they decided to be plaintiffs in a First Amendment action against Georgia Tech. And so they filed a suit in October of 2006. And I want to tell you, this became the most emotionally upsetting case I was ever involved in because about a year, year and a half into the litigation, in February 2008, I was speaking at CPAC, and Ruth actually sat me down. And she said, Dr. Adams, I want you to know in a year or so since we filed this lawsuit, my, my life, it was the best it ever was before, and now it's worse than it's ever been. And I knew why she said it. Someone had put a rape threat on her, on her uh, the, the windshield of her car. 
the year after on the next Valentine's Day that said on this Valentine's Day you will be raped and they actually used the B word after that because they were angry because she, how do you like that? A defender of the speech code uses sexist offensive terminology. What does that tell you? It tells you even the people who support the speech codes know that it's only used to prosecute certain groups right. and certain ideas. Do you see what's happening here? Even more insane than that, they actually held rallies in her um, dorm room, uh, not in her dorm room, in her dorm lobby. And they were walking around with signs that said, Ruth Malhotra is a Twinkie, again followed by the B word, and they were actually passing out Twinkies. And so people naturally get Twinkies handed to them, and they're like, what is this? And they say, it's Ruth Malhotra. She's yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. Is that incredible? You see, that really tells you the mentality on our campuses. These people are not in favor of the principle of comfort. They want to use this as a weapon. This is an ideological war. They think that they're forming coalitions with various minority groups, and they're just going to go attack the white males, and attack the Christians, and attack the conservatives, and all the people who they perceive have authority in our society. And that's why we don't need to be afraid of litigation, is because these people are not principled. This is a very ugly war that's going on. This is a sweet young woman who's experiencing this. And at that time, I didn't know what to say to her. I, my, my heart was broken, and I wish I just had my Bible in my hand at that point, and I wish I could have just turned from, from Genesis 37 to 50 and just, just gone to the story of Joseph. Everyone should read the story of Joseph. You can't possibly think you have a dysfunctional family. What did his own family do to him? You see, he's up here, and then way down there, wasn't he? And then, and then he'd be restored later on, but in, then, in all the in-between, what's the verse that you hear repeated over and over? It's, and God was with Joseph, and God was with Joseph, and God was with Joseph. I just I could say, God is with Ruth, and God is with you know, the right thing. But I just wasn't prepared. So thank goodness, the next time I heard from her was in October, when Judge Owen Forrester ruled in that case. He not only struck down the Georgia Tech speech code as unconstitutional, he actually told Georgia Institute of Technology they couldn't write any more speech or conduct policies for a period of five years without the express permission of the federal court. They not only won the lawsuit, but they got the university grounded for five years. Go to your room. We <laughs> got five years later. It's such an incredible case, it couldn't get better. Yes, it could, I'm not finished. <laughs> they have to come back a few weeks later and determine attorney's fees. And my good friend David French got a reward of $202,000. And they took it and put it in the bank, and we turned around and went after it with that money two more universities with the same result. And I will never forget the next CPAC in February of 2009 when I was at home, and Ruth, uh, uh, Ruth called me. And I wasn't speaking that year at CPAC. She called me and she said, where are you? I said, well, I'm not there this year. I said, where are you? And it was Friday night. And they had just finished with the Reagan uh, Award Dinner, which is the culmination. It's the biggest thing at CPAC because they have a Reagan dinner and they give this thing called the Reagan Award to the most outstanding young conservative activist in America. They give them $10,000. And I sat there and I said, oh, you're the Reagan dinner. I said, oh, she said, yeah. And I said, oh, well, who won the Reagan Award this year? And she said, uh, she said, well, you know, it's a funny thing. It's usually given to one person, but this year it was given to two people. And I said, Ruth, I know you're from the South, but finish the story. I <laughs> <laughs> everyone has a right to be unoffended. <laughs> she finished the story, and she said, you know, it's amazing. She said, it was me and Arit. We won. <laughs> And God was with Ruth. And God was with Ruth. As a result of that, they not only won the most prestigious award in America that can be won for a young conservative activist, but they, they got it on C-SPAN. And they got $10,000. And for a virtual guarantee that they would have good employment for the rest of their lives. Because now they're icons in the conservative movement. And it's just amazing because Ruth... She, she is now working for Ravi Zacharias Ministries now. Nice. She's got her dream job. Why? Because all the hundreds of people who wanted that job, she was able to put that Reagan Award on her resume and stand up. Why? Because she stood up. Yes. And she did the right thing. God's not going to punish you. God's not going to punish you. 
for standing for truth. The road ahead of you may be difficult, but at some point, things will get better. It's the reason I'm standing here today is because I had a decision to make. Ruth had a decision to make. Yeah, it took a little bit of guilting her into it, but it was the right decision. <laughs> but I want you guys to know that you've got friends in the fire who defend defending the court of public opinion. You've got friends at the Alliance Defending Freedom who will defend you in court of law. And, and if you can't be that person that brings forth righteous litigation, that opens up, you see, we need speech because it promotes truth, and the truth is on our side, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. And you can't ever forget that. But if you're not the, berserk, uh, the person to, to step in that position and, and be the actual plaintiff in the litigation, you can be an encouragement for someone else. I'm glad that I pushed them into it. I'm glad that I did it because it changed their lives completely. And so we've got friends who will support us in the court of law. I want to finish this segment of my talk this evening, though, by saying we've got a third weapon that's available to us. We desperately need Christian conservatives running for state legislative office. And this is the thing I've gotten into in the last couple of years. You know, we looked around and I had an idea a couple of years ago. One of my former students' fraternities was thrown off campus in a hearing where they were not allowed to have their own counsel, where they were facing university counsel. And it involved an alcohol violation. And they, they actually they didn't do it. And it actually involved a quasi-criminal accusation. And the university said, well, you know what, we'll call it an administrative hearing and we'll deny your right to counsel. Mm -hmm. And when, when all those kids who were innocent got thrown off campus, I sat down and held a meeting and I actually called my senator. And I actually called the head of the county commissioners and one of the board of governors and the vice president of the fire. And we sat down in a room in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we came up with the idea for the first piece of legislation in the United States of America called the Student Administrative Equity Act, the SAE Act. We didn't tell people what the acronym stood for because the fraternity got, that got thrown off campus was the SAEs. <laughs> it was a little bit of an in-your-face move. But we actually wrote a law in the state of North Carolina that says you can never suspend or expel any university student in a hearing where they aren't allowed to have their own attorney to face the university council. And we wrote that. And this was, I'm, I'm proud to say this was my brainchild, the first one in the United States of America. And we wrote it, and last summer we passed that by a vote of 112 to 1. And it hit the desk of Governor Pat McCrory in August, and he signed it. It is now the law. What do you think of the result of that is going to be? How often are they going to have water buffalo hearings in the state of North Carolina, where they have an absurd accusation that someone's facing expulsion, and they have to face an attorney, and they have to be cross-examined? You see, we passed that last year, but we didn't take it easy after that. The very same year, I was very pleased with Ohio's Religious Liberty Bill that they passed a couple of years ago, because I had an experience with Christian fraternity, that uh, not Christian fraternity, Christian uh, group, that I actually was the advisor for a couple of years, called Rachel Christie. And they were an apologetics group, and the university sat their leadership down and told them they would not approve of them unless they removed the clause saying that their leaders had to be Christians. And I was so absolutely appalled by this. I called the Dean of Students office. They told me to butt out. I got on the phone and I called the fire and Robert Shibley and we wrote them a threat of litigation. We sent them a registered letter and they reversed 48 hours later. And I asked myself this question, how often is it the case that we have some ambiguity in the law and that students have no idea what their rights are? And so I took that Ohio law that said no public university can interfere with the belief structure, the officer requirements, or the internal disciplinary procedures of any religious group at any public university or community college or any belief-based group whatsoever. And I went last year and I tried to push that thing through the Senate and I was busy with the SAE Act and I failed. I'll just tell you I failed. But after my verdict on March 20th of this year, the first thing I did was to drive up to Raleigh and sit down with some lobbyists and say, let's do it again. We lost last year, let's do it again. We're not finished. And so what did we do? I sat down with Jenna Robinson, who works for the John Locke Foundation, a libertarian group. And they got together with Robert Shipley of the Fire. And they also got together with the Family Policy Council and John Ruskin of the state of North Carolina. And the three of them got together and they pushed that thing through. And we got it passed this summer. And just this morning, I got off the phone with the main lobbyist who talks to Governor McCoy and says, is he going to sign it? He said, yes. 
He's going to sign it. We're about to sign that thing in law. And this will be the second legislative act that we passed in two years that have restricted the rights, not the rights, but the, the authority, uh, the abuse of authority of universities to infringe upon the constitutional rights of students. And what am I going to do when I go back in the fall? I'm going to write piece of legislation number three. But it's been easy for me because we've had a political turnover in our state. And I've got Christian representatives that I can call and get things moving through committee. We need that in the state of Colorado. Because if you're going to straighten things out, and if you're going to turn your campus into a free and open marketplace of ideas and protect free speech and protect religious liberty, you got to do three things. Be willing to embarrass them in the court of public opinion. Be willing to defeat them in the court of law. And be willing to go to the legislature and specifically take their authority away. That is all the advice that I have for you, ladies and gentlemen, on the issue of campus rights. If it would be permissible, I'd like to take just a five-minute break and come back and talk about the abortion issue. And I'm serious about what I just talked about. If anyone here is interested in running for office, or you know someone who's in the legislature who has an interest in this topic, when we ran that right to counsel bill, we found that Republicans and Democrats alike voted for the thing. I told you it was 112 to 1. The one was absent. <laughs> Everyone who was present voted for it. Because there are people on both sides of the aisle who recognize that things are completely out of control at our campuses. This is doable. If someone just cares, if someone just watches, if someone is willing to understand the meaning of James 4.17, there are sins of commission and there are also sins of omission. To know the right thing and not do it is a sin. And our, our legislative bodies have been ignoring this problem for too long. It's time we did something about it. If you know that person who wants to move forward, you know who they need to call. Thank you so much. We'll take a little break and be right back if that's okay. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wild 